To some of us old-timers who remember early television, Dr. Cliff Ricketts reminds us of Don Herbert, better known as Mr. Wizard. Ricketts, who is professor in the School of Agribusiness and Agri-Science, seems right at home tinkering around in his shop full of tools, tanks, and automobiles. He'd be the first to tell you that he's not an engineer by profession, but his passion is alternative fuels and figuring out how to run a car or truck on anything other than conventional oil and gasoline. This has a lot of implications for world peace mm -hmm. because we are in Mideast now partially because of oil. We were directly there in 91 right. because of oil. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the other big thing, it has tremendous implications for jobs and the balance of the economy mm -hmm. because from what I understand, our trade imbalance is mainly due to the purchase of foreign oil. Well, again, I mentioned analogous to the Wright brothers because the thing that we got here is not what you would use in a commercial situation, but we've done it mm -hmm. and, and we could do it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and uh, so we've got a system in place that every commuter in the country could daily drive off sun and water. Recently, Ricketts drove his red Toyota Tercel across the state of Tennessee from the northeast to the southwest corner a trip of 500 miles using water and solar power only. How do you do it? Well, he can steer you into as much detail as you want, and he can show you buttons, belts, hoses, meters, solar panels, each having a distinct and important function in the overall operation. The trip went flawless, but it took, uh, it took literally 23 years to even make that trip, and even when I made the first one, I went 13 miles and scrapped it, and that was four years ago. Okay. A lot of people ask, well, where are you going from here? Well, as I said, my number one vehicle is the Prius, and what I want to do next year is drive from coast to coast just on 10 gallons of gasoline. When you hear his explanation, you'll know why Cliff Ricketts is beloved by so many current and former students and why he's exactly where he should be in the college classroom. I was down at Nashville Auto Diesel College uh, uh, about three or four weeks ago for the National Odyssey Day. And the gentleman come up to me that is the career placement guy at National Auto Diesel. He said, my uncle used to work with you. I said, who? He, he said, Jonathan Blunt. I said, really? I said, that's great. He said, he's coming up I-40 right now to take his dad to the doctor. I'm going to tell him you're here. So he pulls in. And I'm telling, I've got one of the vehicles on demonstration, and uh, I'm telling about the first time we ran an engine off water, October the 14th, 1987, and created a bomb in the process. So he walks up behind me and says, I was there, I was with him, and his dad was with him. So I bragged on Jonathan, which he should have been bragged on, and how much he was a part of all of this. And then he met me in Jackson again, he said, Doc, he said, my dad don't talk. He's 84 years old. And he said, to think that his son was a part of something like this made his life. Mm. And he said, he told my mother, he said, you made my dad's life. With a little prompting, Mr. Wizard sets up his table display and begins his demonstration. There's a lot the average person doesn't understand when Cliff gets rolling because his enthusiasm just tumbles out of his mouth in the form of big words and complex processes. This here is the uh, basis of the apparatus that I used in 1987 that I ran my first engine off water. So we simply put water in it. What out of the tap? And then we put Drano in it, our potassium hydroxide, which is a uh, catalyst enzyme. Uh, now, we put it back together, and then we hook the cathode up to the 
positive electrode of the battery. We hook the anode up to the negative post of a battery. Now, due to the chemical process then, and you probably did this in high school chemistry then, then uh, it starts separating the hydrogen and oxygen out of the water. We would start with sun and water, and through all these processes I told you about, we wind up with hydrogen. If only you could harness Cliff Ricketts and store his zest for life and learning in tanks to power the forces of knowledge. One thing is for sure, when Ricketts climbs into his Toyota Tercel this year to make his cross-country run using only about 10 gallons of gasoline, riding shotgun will be his dream of seeing this country less dependent on fossil fuels and more self-reliant on the creativity and innovation that made America what it is. It has to be beyond PowerPoint, right. um, and they're not learning it in classes. So we wanted to provide a space where anyone, regardless of their knowledge level or major, could walk in and... We started in 1911 with a clear mission to train Tennessee's best teachers. For the last 100 years, Middle Tennessee State University has carried out that mission and so much more. Nationally recognized as an affordable quality university, the number one choice of undergraduates in Tennessee. As we celebrate our centennial, we look with pride at the past. We look forward to the future. Check out why we're Tennessee's best. Well, we're back. Welcome back to more of uh, Out of the Blue. I'm Bob Pondillo, and I'm happy you're joining us today. This is the part of the show where we go inside MTSU and find out what's going on, who's doing what, and some interesting things that are happening. And today's certainly not a same. This is what we're going to do. Uh, Heather Lambert is here. Uh, Dr. Lambert is an associate professor of emerging technologies and a librarian at the James E. Walker Library here on campus. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much for coming, if Thanks I may. Thanks for having me. Heather, nice to, nice to have you. Now, you're part, uh, you do one many things, but one of the things you're part of is the Digital Media Studio mm -hmm. located at Walker Library. I have not a clue what that means. <laughs> what, can you tell me about that? I can, yeah. All right. So we noticed that students were needing to be able to create multimedia presentations. Right. And they were lacking two things. One, the facilities to do that, and two, the knowledge. Um, it doesn't matter whether you're going to be a chef, a chemist, a geologist, or an English teacher, you need to be able to make a good multimedia presentation. Certainly these days. Yeah. I mean, it's all about because we're sort of a media-drenched culture, exactly. iconic, icon-driven, and that kind of stuff. So you got to know this stuff. Right. And it has to be beyond PowerPoint. Right. Um, and they're not learning it in classes. So we wanted to provide a space where anyone, regardless of their knowledge level or major, could walk in and get on a piece of equipment and make a movie or edit a video or create a documentary or a DVD or create um, a, a, an orchestrated piece. Wow. And so this is what our, our little area does. 
That's awesome. I didn't it know is. that. And it has not. So uh, I, let's say I'm a student mm -hmm. and I want to do a, I don't know, a, a documentary on something. Mm -hmm. uh, let's choose something. I don't know, an automobile or something, for lack of a better thing to think of. Um, and I can go in there and you and I, uh, I could say I'm clueless about how this stuff works. What will you do for me? How could you help me? Right. If we'll I help you in three ways. All right. First is we can help you with the research to help you find good resources. Okay. Take advantage of some image archives, help you find the footage that you need, and also the good sound research behind it. Now, what happens if, that, if those images are copyrighted? I'm so glad that you asked that. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Happy to um, That's a big issue right now. Sure. A lot of students and even faculty don't understand what fair use is and how copyright mm -hmm. works, and they, they assume if they own the song or find the image online, they can use it, and that's not the case. Not true. So we work really hard to educate about copyright in a way that's not too painful and we have a media resource library of copyright happy copyright approved images sound music the whole nine yards that they can use oh so, so we there, provide so, alternatives so there are stuff you can use There's if you wanted to show an image of a balloon or something you can do that absolutely without mm -hmm. getting in trouble with anybody exactly mm -hmm. super um, how about the actual writing of it though okay. that's more up to you I suppose well that's up to the student but yeah. we do have the writing center in the library now so they're just a floor away so that they can help you with the outline um, and once you get what you want to do and you get the raw materials together you can come back in and we have students and staff that will help you um, learn the equipment find the rep program that's best for you and and get started you know it's so much more than the Dewey Decimal System I mean when yeah. you think of libraries you know you think well there's the, that's where the books are and yes the books and periodicals mm -hmm. and stuff are there but uh, man, it's changed a great deal. Well, a lot. Library library's about information, and we know that having to be able to access information and mm -hmm. make something new and be collaborative and work with our students is where libraries are going, and we want to be part of that. Before we went on the air, I, we were talking about how, you know, librarians have been stereotyped into these sort of bun-wearing, sort of grumpy yes. <laughs> old ladies or whatever. Yes. Mostly ladies, mm -hmm. right? Um, old old uh, women. Uh, and that's certainly not true. I mean, you're so yeah. helpful and kind. In fact, every librarian I've met at our group there at our, at our library have been uh, super. Right. I mean, we get excited about information, but most of us came from other backgrounds. So we have historians, English majors, anthropology students. Um, we have people that are used to be in the music business. We have lots of people that come to this from a second perspective. And wow. their, our passion is just helping students find access to information, students, faculty, and staff. And you say yours, uh, your background was anthropology. Yes. So uh, it, was it that much of a leap between this and being a librarian now? Maybe it was. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yes and no. I mean, yeah. like, I also did nonprofit corporate management and training, so I sort of have a speckled background. But um, <laughs> I think what, one thing that everybody has in common in our building is just a desire to find and know how to find information. So. Sure. Well, just looking at all the various stuff you have, it's just incredible. This uh, idea of web design is huge now, too, mm -hmm. where you have to not only, like you said, the PowerPoints and they may be a little bit even more, mm -hmm. uh, you know, yes. the better than PowerPoint. Yeah. But uh, to, be, to have a web presence is, like, essential. You mm -hmm. can't not have one, it seems. And you can help people with that as well? Absolutely. That, well, not only can we help them with that, but we can help them understand. We run an open source and a commercial lab, half and half, which is a little unique. Uh, explain open source. Yeah. yeah. So commercial software, you buy it, you, pl you install it, and it's right. done. And if you want to buy the upgrade, you buy it next year. Um, and <laughs> that's, that's, right. the, and that's the end of the cost story. You a lot of right. Money, right. And we do have that. Um, mm -hmm. But we also run half open source, which means that we ha work with products that are readily available online, that are supported by a community of developers. Um, okay. That change. It's a very vibrant product. Um, so it's like Linux, right? Exactly. Yeah, it's open yeah. source. It's available for anyone to use. So right. we try to find open source alternatives to all our commercial products so that if students find a product that they like, they can download it on their home PC and continue to use and it. And it doesn't cost you a dime, actually. Right. I, uh, you know, as part of stuff I do here, I write, I help kids write short movies, mm -hmm. short films, narrative films. And we use something called the Keltex mm -hmm. system, which is open source. Mm -hmm. It's uh, free and it works as good as the $200, you know, uh, system you can buy. Yeah. So that's a wonderful idea. Yeah. It's important to be able to find something at every level of economic uh, ability. So. Yeah. Now as far as uh, DVD creation, so uh, a student or me or whoever, a faculty person could actually go in and produce a DVD, which is mm -hmm. for some reason very mysterious to me, but yeah, absolutely. I, know, I know how it works, I just don't know how to make it go on there. Yeah, so. we can do it. <laughs> <laughs> you can help us yeah. with that. Uh, and you have all the different uh, uh, computer systems, all the different platforms. Uh, Mac and PC. We have Macs, we have 12 iMacs with 27 inch screens, and then we have 10 PCs with 24 inch screens. Oh, okay. And they're all loaded up with all kinds of goodies. So, <laughs> so come on down. Yeah. Now, if, um, if parents are watching this mm -hmm. and they've got students that, well, you know, most 
students these days are, are sort of natives, as they say. Right, you know, in digital terms natives. Of, yeah. Digital natives mm -hmm. in terms of uh, understanding stuff, much more than me. Uh, but that means that when they come to a school here, and when they come here, they should have at least that level of knowledge, right, mm -hmm. and more. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where you come in. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Right. So you're going to be able to help them. Help fill the gaps. Excellent. Mm -hmm. and, and it says here, very collaborative. Absolutely. So you're not really going to tell them what to do. You're no. just going to help them sort of get right. there. Right? Our, our area is collaborative. You can put five or six kids at each computer, and then we want to work with you as a partner. Can you check stuff out if you need to take stuff home with you or something? Um, no, but you, we do allow you to bring in any camcorders or videos or equipment that you have. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Well, that's good. And instruction and assistance, so don't be nervous, it mm -hmm. says. Uh, exactly. We'll, we'll help. And I mm -hmm. wonder, do you get people that are just completely clueless? Absolutely, and we love it. Okay, well, that would be me. Yeah, so, yeah. Okay. that's great. I'd mm -hmm. like to be loved. Come on I'll, down. I'll come over, <laughs> absolutely. I'm a faculty member here, so mm -hmm. I should. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in fact, uh, they because I teach in mass comm, and it, it goes so fast, everything, the technology changes mm -hmm. so quickly, they do expect you to go get extra training. Right. Uh, and they do send you out places to learn it, but just to come across the campus to get this. Yeah, we have be... a lot of faculty that think they have to sneak in, and, <laughs> and, and we tell them it's okay. Come on in. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Heather. Thanks I appreciate you me. coming by. Heather Lambert is Associate Professor of uh, an Emerging Tech technologies librarian at the Walker Library here at uh, on campus at MTSU. If you uh, if you ever have a chance to come and take a little tour, come to the library, mm -hmm. check it out. Open, happy, wonderful people that uh, aren't grumpy no. and don't wear buns. Not mm -hmm. mostly. Well, anyway, <laughs> so thank you again, Heather. We Thanks. appreciate it. We'll be back with more of Out of the Blue in just a moment. Stay with us. We started in 1911 with a clear mission to train Tennessee's best teachers. For the last 100 years, Middle Tennessee State University has carried out that mission and so much more. Nationally recognized as an affordable quality university, the number one choice of undergraduates in Tennessee. As we celebrate our centennial, we look with pride at the past. We look forward to the future. Check out why we're Tennessee's best. This is not just a recording studio. This is not just a flight school. This is not just a university. This is MTSU, home of Tennessee's best. One of the great things about doing this program is that it affords us the opportunity to meet fascinating people. Meet a fascinating old soldier, 89-year-old John Ford. Ford lives at the Tennessee State Veterans Home in Murfreesboro, and he's living proof that you're never too old to have a dream. We were privileged recently to find John at the Murfreesboro Airport seated securely in an MTSU 1952 de Havilland Beaver aircraft, ready to soar once again through the sky and bring to life his memories as a member of the Army Air Corps in World War II. A highly decorated pilot who flew B-26 bombers, John received 19 Air Medals while serving his country. As a member of the 9th Air Force, 
He flew 24 hours nonstop on June 6, 1944, in support of the D-Day mission. We are here today um, because one of our residents, Mr. John Ford, verbalized back in May that his last wish would be to be able to fly again. So over the last few months, we've uh, put this together to make that happen for him. With the help of MTSU, Professor Tony Johnston, himself a member of the 118th Airlift Wing of the Tennessee National Guard and the MTSU Aerospace Department, Ford's dream became a reality. This is a, a, a very rare opportunity for us to, to offer a, what I hope is not a last wish for a veteran. He, he's an, uh, an older gentleman, he was a World War II pilot, and, and he basically had communicated that he would like to fly one more time before he passes away. And I was, I was fortunate enough to be able to coordinate a, a flight for him. He probably hasn't been flying in, I, I'm not sure how many years, a lot. Um, but we were able to, to, um, to coordinate a flight, invite a number of the, the military folks that, that I work with at the 118th to come and, and see him off and welcome him back to the ground and, and uh, just give him his, his wish. Let him, let him actually be back in a plane one more time. Yeah. I've, I've known Mr. Ford for several years. Uh, I just, I never realized that he had this wish. Um, and and once, I, once I became aware of what he would like to do, I said, you know, I think we can do this. I, th I think we can make this happen. I've had so many people contribute li in little ways that are significant to Mr. Ford that, to make it all possible. I really appreciate all the support I've gotten from everyone. And Mr. Ford John Ford is a man of few words, and his face doesn't reveal a lot of emotion, but the glimmer in his eye gave him away. He was flying high and loving every minute of it. Two departments at MTSU, along with the Nashville Songwriters Association International, have merged resources to provide students with experiential learning opportunities. You know, you talk about uh, a program like ours, like the Cordy Industry, uh, was very, very important for the employers out there and working in the profession, whether you do it as an employee or a freelancer, is experience. Uh, no one wants to bring in somebody fresh and green with no experience at all. So uh, we talked to students about, you know, let's get involved in an internship program. What is experiential learning? And how does MTSU utilize it to help students become better prepared for the work world? Simply put, experiential learning is hands-on learning. Taking learning out of the classroom into the trenches of the real world. On NashvilleSongwriter.com and um, and it's only fifty dollars for a student member. Um. I don't remember exactly the year so around 2005, four and five Tom Hutchison and I decided that we wanted to have a songwriting emphasis and uh, we try to incorporate uh, a network of mentors in an experiential learning situation uh, where the students actually write five songs during the semester. This is in both classes. Then they document those songs on a CD to turn in at the end of the year, and they turn at the end of the semester. They also turn in a paper on their Partners in Craft experience, which tells me how they reacted with their mentor and what they uh, got out of their uh, situation with their mentor. The Nashville Songwriters Association plays a key role in scheduling live events where students can show off their talents and gain valuable experience. What better place to make this happen than in Music City, USA? What can a student who studies songwriting expect from the program? That's a good question because um, the commercial songwriting program, uh, the chair is Hal Newman and he, um, he gets things together like the vocal workshop tomorrow night and he opens it up to NSAI and commercial songwriting majors first. Uh, what we're doing tonight is Kathy Kiavala is coming. She is a, a, a fantastic 
professional vocalist that has sung with some of the biggest names in show business. But not only that, she, she coaches them. She's a vocal coach. MTSU's Department of Recording Industry, the university's commercial songwriting program, and the Nashville Songwriters Association collaborate to give students that all-important hands-on learning experience. Um, we haven't done something like this before. Dan Pfeiffer is the one that has suggested that I contact Kathy, and um, she's going to be here. Most of the uh, participants tonight are songwriters, but there are four or five engineers and producers from the audio production side that are going to come and uh, see if they can learn how to help their singers become uh, better singers and translate onto the um, digital format. <laughs> uh, we run these recording studios 24 hours a day, seven days a week, uh, in order to provide as much experience for the students as we can. Uh, more and more these days, we're trying to partner up between classes and events. I'll give you an example. Uh, my studio production class is partnering with the advanced music engineering class and then we're partnering with a record label class uh, to, to work uh, together as a collaboration to do things for the label and also to fulfill the class requirements. And uh, that brings an A&R function into that environment and uh, students are trying to learn from this new dynamic. Of course we are too, because <laughs> it's kind of a new deal this time around. Outside of the classroom, students participate in studio recording sessions, live performances, rub shoulders with professionals in the business, and attend workshops. Our main mission uh, for this semester is to play out as much as we can, because that's a very big thing um, for songwriters these days. I think a lot of people play and write their own songs, but not a lot of people get to go out and show off what they do, you know. Um, so we've played at Nashville Palace and um, some at Hotel Indigo. With classroom learning as a foundation, these hands-on experiences give students an edge beyond traditional learning. The one thing that I tell everybody, you know, students when they come here, I say, you know, you can come stick your nose in a book for four years and graduate through this program. And certainly that'll do you some good, but uh, if you're not doing the networking things while you're here, internships, partnering with people in other classes and other areas, and building your team essentially of contacts, uh, you're not really doing all the things that you need to to be successful in our industry. And there's no doubt that in a competitive field like music production, learning in the trenches of the real world is as good as gold maybe even platinum. Join us in celebrating 100 years of MTSU history. Check out the Centennial Timeline at mtsu.edu slash centennial.